It is good to see each and every one of you here tonight as we go through our study on what Baptists believe. We've moved into our second part, Jesus Christ, His incarnation, and His virgin birth. That's what we're looking at tonight. And as I said, it, it, it's kind of funny that that song we just talked about, the incarnate word, and we're dealing tonight with the incarnation. Now, some, something that all of you may not know is we use that word incarnate or incarnation, but that word never does appear in the Bible. There's a lot of words we use that don't appear in the Bible. Here's another one, Trinity. You will not find that word in the Bible. Now, we will find the idea of the Trinity. We find the idea of His incarnation. That's point A there. The idea, though, is present throughout the New Testament. Incarnation means that God, in Jesus Christ, revealed Himself to man in flesh and body. So... Is it proper and correct for a Christian to say that Jesus Christ is God? Yes. Is it proper for a Christian to say that Jesus Christ was man? Yes. He was fully God and He was fully man. The term we use to describe God coming to us in the flesh is incarnation. 1 Timothy 3.16 says this, And most certainly, the mystery of godliness is great. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. Man, if that verse won't preach, there's a lot in that verse. But, you see here, uh, Paul is writing to Timothy and telling him, That yes, God came in the flesh. Therefore, God, who is spirit, manifested himself to the natural senses of man. So, was God hungry? Yes. Was God thirsty? Yes. Was he tired? Was he this? Was he that? Yes, he manifested himself in the flesh. John 4.24 says this, God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. 1 John 1, 1 through 1-3 says this, What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have observed and have touched with our hands concerning the Word of life, that life was revealed, and we have seen it, and we testify and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. What we have seen and heard we also declare to you, so that you may also have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. So first, so John's writing here, and the shorter epistles, not the gospel, but he's saying, listen, we see this. We heard it, we observed it, we touched it. This Jesus, God coming in the flesh, is real. That's what John's trying to tell us in those short verses there. The idea of the incarnation was a major theological issue in the first century. Now we need to remember that. Me and you take it for granted, right? I mean, if a church doesn't preach God coming in the flesh, Jesus Christ, then you can't really call them a church, right? Right? But this was debated in the first century. We have the Gnostic philosophers. They denied the incarnation. The Docetic Gnostics said that Jesus only seemed to have a flesh and blood body. The Serenthian Gnostics said that Christ, the deity, came upon Jesus at his baptism and left him on the cross. Thus they believed Christ was neither born nor And Christ didn't die. That was some of the teaching in the first century from these Gnostics. They said, okay, that little baby that messed his diaper, that little kid that didn't obey his parents all the time, that little kid that that cried and fell, and you know, that, that wasn't Christ. 
And then it came upon Jesus in the flesh at the baptism. And, and when they, they nailed Him to the cross... Christ left again, the anointed, the Messiah. So that was just a normal body up there. This was some of the false teaching going on in the first century. Now, John argues against these Gnostic sects. He says this, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed His glory, the glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Okay. He says again, 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. As a human, Jesus grew tired, became hungry, thirsty. He died, and He was buried. He knew emotion, wonder, compassion, and joy. He was tempted, yet He was without sin. He was fully man. He went through all the emotions. He went through everything. Yet He was God. He could not sin. The God-man. You know, I'll be honest with you. Some of this stuff does sound far-fetched, right? I mean, that's the reason, uh, you know, you really do have to have faith. I mean, to believe that God came and died for me? I mean, that sounds crazy. I mean, the Scripture says to those that don't believe, it's foolishness. But that is why God gave us His Word. And that's why God commands us to go out and tell others about Him. About how He came and gave His life that none would ever have to perish, but every single person that would accept Him could have eternal life. As God, Jesus forgave sin, assumed judgeship, revealed God's will, arose from the dead, and commissioned His church. Now, when you read the Gospels, you see every bit of that, right? Jesus, as God, being God, had all authority. He even, I mean, could cast out demons with his voice. Paul affirms this in 2 Corinthians 5.19. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them, and He has committed the message of reconciliation to us. Let me boil that down. In Christ, in Jesus, God reconciled the world to Himself. Man sinned. It was through Jesus that God reconciled us back to Him. And now it says that God's not counting our sin against us because of Jesus. And not only that, but that Jesus reconciled us back to God. But... Paul gives us extra. He says, now God has committed the message of reconciliation to us. So church, it's plain to see now that God has given us a message and a mission, right? Yeah. The message is we can be reconciled back to God and our mission is to go tell others about that. We have a great responsibility Anybody that tells a new believer the Christian life is an easy life is wrong. I mean, this is a hard life. Now, we don't have it as hard as some other Christians across the world. They're getting beheaded and, and uh, everything else for their faith. But Jesus said, count the cost. This ain't an easy road. Pick up your cross. Deny yourself. Follow me. <clears throat> so, we have there the incarnation of Jesus. What it meant, what it was, those that taught against it and what they taught. That Jesus was not God as a child and was not God when He died. Which is false. So we have the incarnation. Now, one of the early things we learn about the incarnation, God coming to us, is His virgin birth. His virgin birth. Well, the first thing I want to tell you is the Bible teaches the virgin birth. Uh, Genesis 3.15 God tells the serpent, I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. 
So, way back in Genesis chapter 3, the third chapter of the entire Bible, God says there's going to be one coming that's going to crush your head and you're going to hurt his heel. So the virgin birth was prophesied all the way back there. Then you got Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore, the Lord Himself will give you a sign. See, the virgin will conceive, have a son, and name him Emmanuel. Matthew 1, 23. See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. So not only do you see in Matthew 1 the birth of Jesus... You see the Scripture literally showing us the prophecy in Isaiah being fulfilled. I don't know how much more clear the New Testament writers could have made it to the Jewish nation that that Messiah you've been looking for since Isaiah, this is Him. John 1.14 The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed His glory and the glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Galatians 4.4 4. When the time came to completion, God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under the law. The virgin birth is taught throughout the Scripture. There is no refuting that. But, people have found a way. Number two, the questioning of the virgin birth comes, that should be out of, modern liberalism. Within the last 100 to 200 years, and it's literally been that soon, people have started questioning the virgin birth. Up until then, there was no question about it. But with modern liberalism, there is a question about the virgin birth. Until recently, the virgin birth was not questioned. (coughs) Modern denials outside of Gnosticism are based on so-called rationalistic, scientific, and historical ground. They try to push the virgin birth aside because it involves a miracle. You can't prove a miracle. That's the reason it's a miracle, right? you got to have faith. Okay, so we as Christians, to refute modern liberalism as far as the virgin birth, we have to ask, is the virgin birth reasonable? Well, how else could God redeem His people? As Christians, we understand that. I cannot die for my sin. As much as I love you guys, I can't die for your sin. Why? Because I am sin. I'm full of it. Just ask anybody that knows me. But, because Jesus was without sin, He could pay the ultimate price. His blood was shed to cover our sin because He was sinless. We go back to Isaiah, not that chapter 7, but chapter 53. It says there's the Messiah will be like a lamb without blemish. Meaning sinless, spotless, white as snow. Um, how else could Jesus be sinless if He wasn't the Messiah? If He wasn't born of a virgin? If He had mankind DNA that bothered him, he couldn't be sinless. Without the virgin birth, Jesus is just another man and not a Savior. So reasonably, as a Christian, we understand there could be no other way. It had to be a virgin birth for one to be without sin. So, the next question. Is the virgin birth scientific? Science does not know or allow God's laws. Being miraculous, the virgin birth works within God's laws, not man's. It is God's working in His laws, unknown to man, to accomplish His spiritual purpose. Now listen to this. If God can create human life by natural law... Can He not create divine human life by spiritual law? Think about that. If God can create David by natural law, could He not create the Messiah through spiritual, godly law? Well, of course He could. God can do anything God wants to do. 
Now, if we try to put him in a man-made box, that's just stupid. He's God. He does not fit in our man-made boxes. You cannot confine his set of rules to our set of rules. I mean, I have a hard time reading the Velveeta shells and cheese directions to make a pot of mac and cheese. God spoke the universe into existence. Now think about that. <laughs> and we're trying to say God's abilities are limited to what we understand. Makes no sense. <clears throat> Is the virgin birth historical? The Gospels are credible historical records. And we need to remember that. Some people say that there are fallacies. There are inconsistencies in the Bible. Church, that is not true. If we don't believe the Bible is true, there is no step B. I mean, there's a reason I get up here every Sunday morning because we have visitors, we've got people that ain't here all the time, and I say, open your scriptures, open the Bible, because the Bible is... And I list it off. It's infallible. It's inspired. And I'm off on another tangent, but I forget the other word. Uh, inerrant. That's what it is. The Bible is inerrant, meaning there's no errors. The Bible is infallible, meaning it, it cannot be wrong. And the Bible is inspired, therefore it comes directly from God. If we don't believe on those three consistencies, the next 45 minutes that I'm up here mean nothing. If we don't believe the Bible, the sermon is worth nothing. Because David doesn't get up here and give you a TED Talk. I get up here and preach. I tell you what God says, not what I say. Because David is errorful. David is fallible. And David's not inspired. Anyway, the Gospels are credible historical records. We can believe what the Gospels say about the life of Jesus. Luke was a scientist and historian and discusses the virgin birth and never ever discredits it and its historical accuracy. If anybody was going to put a, a, a light on a subject like the virgin birth, the resurrection, it would have been Luke. I'm not picking on Matthew, Mark, and John, but Luke was highly educated. A physician, a physician, a scientist, a historian. Luke would have been the one to study these things before he wrote about them. He did. Uh, Luke was not a first uh, person account. He went back and interviewed other people. He studied these things. He's not mentioned, but you can see Luke all the, well, he is mentioned, but not all the way. But you can see Luke all the way through the book of Acts with Paul and with others learning about Jesus. But Mary was the first person to question the virgin birth. Listen to what Mary says. Uh, Luke 131. Mary asked the angel, How can this be since I have not had sexual relations with a man? <laughs> She's a teenage girl. She's like, how in the world is this going to work? She's like, you know, this makes no sense that you're telling me I'm pregnant and I've not had sexual relations with a male. She knew how these things worked. But listen to God. God's response in, the, in three verses later. For nothing will be impossible with God. Now church, I don't know about you, but that right there just about settles the entire conversation today. Nothing is impossible with God. We're talking about the incarnation. We're talking about the virgin birth. And to those that don't believe, it can sound far-fetched. I'm not going to pretend it doesn't. I know a lot of people that told me, you know, David, before I got saved, that was one of my hookups. I, I just couldn't believe in a virgin birth. But now that they're saved, of course they believe in it. Because you, you can't get saved without believing in the virgin birth. I mean, that is the focal point of salvation, right? <laughs> it's through that virgin birth that, that Christ has the ability to pay for my sin debt. 
And I just love, like I said, I, I love that response. For nothing is impossible with God. And I don't have it in our notes, but one of my favorite verses, I believe it's Hebrews 6, right? For without faith, it is impossible to please God. If somebody ever comes to you and says, you know what, if you can prove to me there's a God, I'll believe it. You're not going to be able to prove God. I mean, he says so in his own word, right? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. you got to have faith. That's what it takes. That's the reason we share the Gospel over and over. Very few people believe in the Lord Jesus Christ the very first time they hear about Him. Because it takes faith. It takes learning more about Him. It takes seeing God in their lives and and, in our lives through Him. You know, I heard wise people tell me the greatest sermon that we can ever preach is our lives. There's not a one of us here tonight that's not been through something hard. And I will tell you this. When you went through those hard times in your life, I promise you, there were lost people watching. Do they have something different in them? How do they handle that obstacle? Do they truly have something more than I have? Not saying we don't go through hard times perfectly, right? I got asked a hard question the other day. <clears throat> Y'all know that little girl here in the community passed away. And a teenager asked me, they said, How can God allow something like that to happen? And of course, I explained to them that death and sin was never God's will. You see Genesis 1 and 2. Everything God ever did, He looked back and said, man, that's good. And then Genesis 3 came. And He had to talk to Adam. He had to talk to Eve. And He had to talk to the serpent because mankind brought sin into this world. And for the wages of sin is death, right? Mankind, me and you, our sin is what brought cancer, death. That was never God's will. Some of these teenagers in the community are going to be looking at our youth group here. How do those kids handle this? Now, I'm not saying they're not going to cry, they're not going to mourn, they're not going to question things. Because I did. And I was a lot older than them. I was probably 25, 26 when me and Gina went through a miscarriage. And I was called into the ministry. And you have those big theological questions, you know. God, how can this be part of... Your will. Your purpose. And it wasn't. It's never God's will that somebody die, right? That's sin. For the wages of sin is death. That's a good good verse. But it's only half the verse. But the gift of God is eternal life. We brought sin into the world and then God gave us eternal life through the Son. That's the second part of that verse. That little girl may have passed away, but through God's incarnation and His death, that girl claimed to be a believer, and now she's with her Savior. That is something that's impossible, but not to God. Thank you guys. Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank You for the virgin birth. Thank You that there's one that paid the ultimate penalty for my sin. Lord, as I brought this precious child up tonight, Father, continue to be with her family. She claimed to be saved, Father, so we rejoice in that, but we know Mom and Dad's still going to mourn. Father, this community's going to mourn. Father, we don't understand everything on this side of glory. But we have enough faith to know that You do. Father, I mentioned my miscarriage. And Father, I know that wasn't Your will, but you know what? You always turn something bad into something great. 
I may have lost that one child, God. But now you give me four. You're such a good, gracious God. And I thank you for that. For it's in the precious and holy name of Jesus we pray. Amen. How about three?